Hi, and welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. There's a religious vocation that we've spent almost no time talking about. In order for you to be safe to talk about theology and have men and women in books discussing the obscure meaning of a Greek word in a safe, nice university, your land has to be safe, free from invasion. And this Memorial Day, I wanted to provide a video to you on the role of chaplains and spirituality, particularly during wartime. During most wars, the civilian populations directly impacted by war respond to the fear and uncertainty about life with a general return to religious ideas, not necessarily orthodox, and they cope with violent death and the risk of it with increased supernaturalism in day-to-day -day life. The stories of Abraham Lincoln and Mary Lincoln and their seances in the White House are embedded in our national lore and serve as an example. One need only travel to a Civil War battlefield to get that sense of the retained energy of trauma that occurs there. There's always been a day to honor military members who have died. But it was in 1971, by an act of Congress, that Memorial Day was nationalized as a holiday to honor all military members who have died while serving in U.S. forces. So why now? Why talk about military chaplains this Memorial Day? Well, we don't know much about them. They represent real-life boots-on-the-ground ministry that has no place for arguments over theology or doctrine. The chaplains deal with life and death. Also, I happen to believe, in my opinion, in the near future for our generations, after many generations of peace, may face some of the very things we'll talk about today. And I can't help but hope that my message about military chaplains and Memorial Day and the people they helped might make us take a different path or turn around or at least have a sober eye about what might be in front of all of us. Let's debunk an offset myth to begin with. There's a famous saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, that's not true. But the role of chaplains is so much bigger than one would expect. They're far from curse word free men of reverence in the real life roles they serve in combat. They are the only link many times to morality, mortality, humanity, and peacetime civilization that is so distant sometimes to the combat soldier. World War II U.S. Army veteran Nelson Peary said, quote, that's what happens to us in combat. We cease to be individuals. We become part of a machine that kills, that bayonets people, that sets fire to people and laughs at the people when they're burning up, you know, from getting hit with a flamethrower. They're running down the trail screaming in agony and you laugh and it's because you're no longer an individual, you're part of a machine, a killing machine. What must God think of these combat soldiers in the context of morality? Clearly in the Bible, God sets different standards for the soldier than the civilian. And further, for that matter, many soldiers aren't volunteers. They get drafted, conscripted, impressed on threat of death. They're defending their own homes. And they get indoctrinated into a machine. The famous biologist, author, and World War II combat Marine Private First Class, Eugene B. Sledge, affectionately known by his fellow Marines who fought together on Peleliu and Okinawa as Sledgehammer, he once said in an interview for a four-part series for British television called Hell in the Pacific that an anonymous World War II Marine poem once said, when he gets to heaven to St. Peter, he'll tell another Marine reporting for duty, I've served my time in hell. 
a sailor of the same time said, you have to hate to go on. Otherwise, there'd be no point to it. Hell, you have to have a reason. Hating them was all the reason I needed. Another World War II veteran said, at times you were just beside yourself as to how, where, and what to do first. 18 and 19 year old kids were doing trauma surgery for God's sake and out there treating these boys. They would cry for their mothers. Mom, help me. Let's consider for a moment the survivors of tragedies like the USS Indianapolis torpedoed and sunk in less than 15 minutes and hundreds of survivors being picked off for days floating in the Southern Pacific Ocean by sharks. Downed pilots floating in the vast nothingness of the expansive oceans for days adrift. Imagine the survivors of the destruction of the HMS Hood, only three survivors from the whole ship. Or the destruction of the German Bismarck in the Atlantic. Many survived that, getting into the water. The British ships came by and threw ropes over the side so the men could climb up. The sailor's code transcended the fight between these two enemies. But many survivors were left behind because the British ships got word that U-boats were coming to the area and not knowing whether they were there to rescue survivors or attack them. They left and left all those men in the ocean to drown. And what of the accidental sinking of the cruise liner off the African coast by the German U-boat that realized its error, surfaced, put together a rescue mission, radioed for support for local military, including Americans and allies, only to have the American planes begin to strafe the survivors so the U-boat had no choice but to cut the survivors free and submerge or risk sinking themselves. Such evil we do to each other. So what type of person is equipped to provide soul care under these conditions? How do they do it? Perhaps most interestingly, they're volunteers and they're outside the military chain of command. This is a great benefit to the soldiers and officers because the chaplains were so important for morale they were known as the biggest rule breakers because they would break any rule they needed just to bring a bit of extra food or a luxury from home to the soldiers on the front lines just to, just to lift their spirits, anything they could do. At home, those that were priests and rabbis found themselves in uniform, unarmed, equal in rank to whoever they happened to be speaking to at the moment, and trying to help men who were simply killing watching their friends die, sleeping, eating, and fighting next to corpses in various states of degradation and trying not to be killed themselves. The chaplain's job was to help them retain some sense of humanity. In the German army prior to World War II, there were Catholic priests who would come to the battlefields and administer sacraments. And there were field rabbis to lead combat soldiers in prayer. After the rise of World War II German leaders to power, the field rabbis were done away with. And because of the pagan leanings of the political system, chaplaincy was discouraged. Yet still, German Christians volunteered to follow men into war to deliver last rites and some semblance of the divine. In the USSR, chaplaincy was not permitted because it went against the Leninist communist principles. Again, Christians in hiding became chaplains and under the nose of the political commissar officers aided in the soul care of the tragically afflicted. It was really in the US and Commonwealth allies where chaplains became highly respected. Interestingly, chaplains were not considered combatants and according to the Geneva Convention, were not allowed to be taken as POWs. If caught, they were to be returned home at the first chance that the enemy had. But many stayed behind with the men in the camps and continued to live a life of self-sacrifice and soul care. In this place, theology doesn't matter, doctrine doesn't matter, 
remembering names matters, passing on pictures and trinkets and pockets of blown apart soldiers and making sure letters and keepsakes made their way home, prayers, last rites, giving their own near starvation rations to soldiers who needed it. That was the role of the chaplain. In one account during the Battle of Iwo Jima in February of 1945, a frontline soldier was blown to bits. A morphine surrette was given to him, and he asked for the Catholic chaplain to come give last rites. The area was so hot with flying lead that no one could come or go. And it fell to the Jewish rabbi chaplain, who happened to be in the next foxhole, to selflessly climb out at great risk place his body over the dying Marine and deliver the last rites of a Catholic priest to this man. So in many ways, chaplains are the only links to reality. They bear the weight of traversing hell with soldiers and being the only ones to hold on to the reality that they will get out of there. There is an afterlife and there is an after war. Sometimes chaplains were the only means of justice for enemies captured by the Allies. On numerous occasions, retribution killings were carried out by both sides. It was most often the appeals of chaplains to moral rightness that saved the lives of many who may have deserved to die given their own inhumanity. After the embarrassing loss of the British at Dunkirk, on the shores of France, on word of Winston Churchill and his need to appear to take the initiative, he sent a small detachment of men to attack Hitler's western wall, the occupied French coast. On August 19, 1942, John Weir Foote, a Canadian chaplain, went with the Royal Hamilton Light Infantry on an amphibious assault. That quickly went bad and left men and equipment being picked up on the beach. With no weapon, he went time and again to retrieve the wounded and bring them back to the outgoing ships to England. Knowing that some had been taken prisoner, he gave his seat, the last seat on the LST, to a wounded soldier, and he walked up the beach and surrendered, and he stayed with his men until his liberation in 1945. In an even more astounding account, James Hughes O'Neill, an army chaplain, was appointed to General George Patton's staff in 1944 when the Battle of the Bulge came and the Americans were on the run and disorganized and foul winter weather prevented the U.S. from stopping the rapidly devolving situation. Patton called for Chaplain O'Neill and commanded him to draft and deliver a prayer that the weather would clear and thus allow the Americans to break the stalemate at Bastogne. He prayed, Dear God, restrain these moderate rains with which we have to contend. Grant us fair weather for battle. Graciously hearken to us as soldiers who call upon thee that armed with thy power we might advance from victory to victory and crush the oppression and wickedness of our enemies and establish thy justice among men and nations. Over the next days, the weather cleared and Patton awarded Chaplain O'Neill the Bronze Star on the spot. All around the world at any given time, these chaplains are doing the same exact business today. Soldiers die all the time in combat, in accidents, and in all manner of related activities, we just don't hear about them. The amount of education required for chaplains, even at hospitals or for public services, is higher than in any other vocation of ministry. They serve such a unique and necessary position that is indispensable. So many return from combat damaged physically and mentally it's likely it would be far worse if it were not for chaplains. The tools of their job? Prayer, self-sacrifice, 
And you're going to love this. We spend so much time talking about ritual and denomination and which are right and which are wrong. But when you're leaning over someone dying and all they want is to see a rosary or heard it prayed, you'd keep one in your pocket in a second. They look like this. They're predominantly used in ecumenical faiths, predominantly Catholic. Holy water. A small metal trinket or relic. We would argue over the iconoclasm controversy because we have that privilege because there's not soldiers marching down the street and I'm not at risk of tanks rolling over the hill behind my house right now. A cross, a simple cross. A small book of the gospel and prayers. It was inside a small Bible that Eugene B. Sledge wrote notes. They were forbidden from doing in case they were captured by the enemy, with which he would later convert into the book with the old breed on Peleliu and Okinawa by Eugene B. Sledge. If you're interested in learning more about being a chaplain, there's a lot of places to go. Google serves, obviously. The Army has a uh, chaplain corps. The National Guard has a chaplain corps. Every major service has a chaplain corps. Your local hospital has a chaplain corps. You can volunteer at hospice. Do you have what it takes to do the selfless work of a chaplain? You can check goarmy.com careers. Ladies and gentlemen, on this Memorial Day, I would like for all of us to remember that regardless of what you think about your country and what good they've done and not done, we've enjoyed generations of peace that have allowed us to connect around the world in ways never thought possible. Many would argue that that peace is at risk now. On this Memorial Day, I encourage you to consider those who weren't just collateral damage during a war, they willingly volunteered to walk into hell so that people like us didn't have to. It's quite remarkable. I hope you and your family enjoy a cookout or just some time together today. That's important for the Christian life too. I'd like to tell you thank you for watching today, and you can support us. All the usual stuff's down in the description, PayPal, etc., etc. Today you might consider donating a dollar or two to a military organization or chaplains. Find a chaplain in your community and uh, throw them a dollar or two. They're living by the auspices of God, I'm quite sure. I know quite a few. Uh, I would like to close today in prayer and in dedication a man I know well, who's a great mentor of mine, his son served this country in Afghanistan and was killed in combat. His name was Julian Chase. His name was Julian Chase, and his father and his friends and those that know him will make sure that his name does not fade away. And you must make sure that the names of your relatives that have fought and died for you don't fade away either. God bless you, my friends. May your work today bear fruit. May God guide us in the way we should go. May he guide our words that they might be useful. Happy Memorial Day. Thanks.
from that empty pack You can keep that shirt from off my back And two cigarettes from that empty pack Cause you 